This is the Japan most of us recognize, congested and kinetic. But Japan also has a wild side. Beyond its crowded cities, especially in winter, Japan reveals moments of quiet and unexpected beauty. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. Japan is a chain of islands that lies to the east of the Korean Peninsula in the North Pacific. We're visiting mountainous Honshu, the country's largest island, and rugged, sparsely populated Hokkaido to the north. The Japanese have a complex view of nature infused with ancient Shinto and Buddhist beliefs. It's this elusive quality that I'm trying to convey through my lens. Joining me is Lucy Kraft, a journalist who has worked on conservation issues in Japan for nearly a decade. Lucy, it's gorgeous up here. Isn't it wonderful? I mean, this is one of the best kept secrets about Japan art. I mean, we always think of Japan as being cities, of being, you know, Tokyo, this huge metropolis. But in fact, most of the country is mountainous. This is what really gave the Japanese the sense that there were gods up here, and they built lots of shrines to worship these gods. Lucy, I'm sure that the other times of the year are really beautiful, but from my taste, coming here in the winter, it looks like a giant etching. The Japanese have a very interesting way of how they perceive beauty. Their sense of beauty is always tinged with a little bit of sadness, a little bit of loneliness. That's what they, they find most appealing. A good example of that would be a snowflake. A uh, snowflake is gorgeous in its perfection. It lasts a few seconds, it hits the ground, and then it's gone. So the lesson is that life is transitory. Koyasan was started as a religious place about 1,200 years ago. This is really where the gods of Shinto and Buddhism were thought to reside. People have been coming here on pilgrimages for over a thousand years. Can you explain to me the difference between Buddhism and Shintoism? Shinto is the native religion of Japan. It's an animist religion. Everything, a, a tree or a rock or a bridge or anything could be a god in the Shinto religion. Buddhism was brought over from India uh, by way of China. They sort of made it their own and they put the two of them together. It's a, it's a very flexible way of approaching religion. They sort of believe in two at the same time. snowing, a monk is sweeping the steps to the shrine. It's one of those moments that seems timeless. Right now, this Buddhist monk is walking towards me in the blowing snow. Just a beautiful, quiet scene. The Japanese talk about something called mono no aware. It's this idea that nature is fleeting, people are fleeting, beauty is fleeting, and that's what makes it beautiful. You see this reflected in the temples that we're walking past. You know, these aren't made out of granite or marble, they're made out of wood. This stuff's gonna rot away in, in a certain period of time. Things that are impermanent. Exactly, and the things that are the most beautiful are just fleeting, as man is.
These monks are taking purified rice to the Buddhist temple. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It's wonderful. These moments of quiet solitude and seeing tradition are ones that I'll take back to Seattle and I'll just remember this moment. It's so peaceful. Tradition, atmosphere, peacefulness, it all comes together here at Koyasan. That's you. That's beautiful. Thank you. You two live in a beautiful place. Okay. Oh, my best one. <laughs> the frozen ethereal beauty of Japan is perhaps most untamed on the northern island of Hokkaido. It is freezing here in Hokkaido. It's zero degrees Fahrenheit. I've come up a volcano to photograph a crater lake. This is Mashu Lake. I've been distracted by these beautiful dead birch trees that are right on the volcano's edge and they're catching the first light of the rising sun. These trees are very, very expressive. They almost look like dancers, frozen in place with their limbs out there stretched, contorted, and suddenly my main subject becomes secondary to these beautiful trees. What I'm trying to do is take the Japanese aesthetic of simplicity and serenity and make it come alive in my photos. Hokkaido is a pretty surprising place. Yeah, it is amazing. It's considered the wilderness of Japan. Um, was settled a lot later than the rest of Japan. It was originally inhabited only by Aborigines, the Ainu people. It's very sparsely populated. This is where Japanese come when they want to see nature. I've got this entire lake to myself. That is myself and about 150 whooper swans. Beautiful, graceful swans that come down the coast of Siberia and winter over here on Hokkaido. Occasionally these birds sit up on their haunches and just flap their wings to just stretch like humans would. It's a beautiful sight. These whoopers have such an elegant shape that they're really revered by many cultures around the world. The Japanese in particular are drawn towards really simple and elegant forms. It's just a very, very different shot of a whooper with their long necks tucked in to their feathers. Beautiful. This is the way photography should be.
This is a vast wetland. It's actually as big as central Tokyo. This is the type of habitat that the red-crowned crane actually prefers. The famous red-crowned crane that used to migrate all over Japan now is confined to this area. Wow, listen to that. That's beautiful. The crane is actually almost like the unofficial national bird of Japan. It's inspired so much poetry, so much literature, so much beautiful art. Wedding kimonos traditionally had this bird on the back of them. The crane, because it lives so long, because it mates for life, um, is a symbol of marital fidelity and long life. What I love about these birds are just the dance, the graceful dances, mm -hmm. and the winds mm -hmm. go up, and they just seem to interact so beautifully. And, oh, the dancing is so cool. These birds are really performing for us. Look at that one dancing. <laughs> Look at that. That is so beautiful. Okay, I am definitely a happy camper right now. <laughs> they are so beautiful when they spread out those wings and just go straight up in the air. Just like artwork. When I was here 15 years ago, I didn't see these numbers. I wonder if they've increased since then. Significantly. Just in the 1920s, there were just a few dozen. They thought they were going to lose them forever. We're up to about 1,000 birds now. This is because of feeding. They've, they've had to feed them. Their habitat has shrunk, and they don't have any food. This is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in that their numbers have increased, but they don't migrate anymore, which is always bad for the gene pool. There's great fear among the bird conservation societies that one fell swoop from a disease and would wipe the whole flock out. People often think if you leave nature alone, it will take care of itself. People don't realize that nature is itself artificial. These animals are living in vastly reduced habitats and they need help if they're gonna stay healthy and alive. Back on the island of Honshu, one mountain is iconic. Fuji is Japan's most famous landmark. The Japanese love Fuji. I have found my spot and it's down in this frozen mud. There's this tiny little pond that's maybe 15 feet across. And in this pond, when the wind dies down, I can get a really nice reflection. What makes this mountain so famous in my mind is the beautiful symmetry of the summit. The light is happening. Beautiful pink. Alpen Glow, just reaching the summit now. On a sublimely beautiful morning like this, you can really understand why the Japanese love Fujisan.
These are snow macaques or Japanese macaques, also known as snow monkeys. These are adorable macaques that live in the very precipitous mountains of central Japan on Honshu Island. They have been habituated over the years. They're drawn towards the natural hot springs. They're the most northern primate on Earth, and they're the only primate that has learned to bathe. The story of the bathing began back in the 1960s when the young ones, which are naturally curious, got into the hot springs at a lodge down the valley. So many monkeys were coming into the lodge, it got to the point that the lodge put in this hot spring up the valley so that these monkeys would have their own hot spring. This little monkey is so adorable and it's so curious. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he's got a rock in his mouth. Oh, that's too cute. Oh, baby. Ah, oh, he even makes sound. It's like a squeeze toy. His eyes are so clear and his little hands are so amazing. Oh, this is a nice shot. Great shots of monkeys jumping across this rock. They're coming right over this snow-covered rock. Beautiful shots, getting him in mid-flight. Here goes one right now. I got three snow macaques right on the edge of this mountain stream. Just a conglomeration of fur and pink little faces. It's really adorable. It's how they survive in this very harsh environment is the ability to stay close together for warmth and security. Just as tight as three animals could possibly be. This is why I travel so much. Moments of intimacy like this really reward me. Not only am I getting some great shots, but it's also an excellent opportunity to witness behavior. Just to see how these primates interact with one another, the play behavior, the aggression between babies, the scolding. <laughs> these are undoubtedly the cleanest monkeys in the world. Every winter on the coldest day of the year, a unique Shinto festival gets underway just before midnight. We are in the middle of one of the oldest shrines in Japan, in Okayama. This is one of the most important evenings of the year. It's the Naked Man Festival. Before the end of the evening, over 9,000 men will vie for two wooden amulets called Shingi. And if they get that amulet, they will have good luck for the rest of the year. These men are shouting, Wachoi, Wachoi. Wonderful, wonderful. Now it's starting to get interesting. As hundreds of men start circling through and taking a purifying bath. They're cold, they're wet, they're drunk. This tradition goes back 500 years, and in modern Japan, it's really exciting to see traditional ways being celebrated on such a massive scale. 
talk about a sea of humanity. It literally looks like a sea of ebbing and flowing as these people keep pushing each other. All you can see is heads and arms and torsos interlocked and swaying back and forth. This is chaos. Look at them fall. Now it happens. This is amazing. Two very lucky guys in the crowd, and for the rest, there's always the next year. The shrine known as Kasuga Taisha is one of the most revered in all of Japan, with over 3,000 lanterns on the grounds. The lighting of the lanterns is a 900-year-old tradition that marks the transition from winter into spring. This is the moment where I really feel this tradition. The monks are chanting, the candles are lit, and it's very, very mystical. I love the textures, the feeling, the ambiance, the mysticism of these temples. The ancient traditions are everywhere you look. It just is magical for me. Japanese know that beauty is fleeting. As a photographer, I can relate to this awareness that things move us with their impermanence. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge. Here along the edge of Australia's Northern Territory lies an ancient landscape 50,000 years ago, Aboriginals called it home and still do. This is the place of the dream time where land and story meet. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. Northwest Australia is one of the last true wilderness areas. It's vast and untamed, and as brutal as it is beautiful. Australia is huge, almost as large as the continental United States. We'll be exploring Western Australia's remote Kimberley Plateau and Arnhem Land at the top end of the Northern Territory. I've asked Ian Morris, a renowned naturalist who's lived among the Aboriginal people for 40 years, to teach me about the place. Ian, tell me a little bit about Arnhem Land. It's probably the only bit of really decent Aboriginal Australia left as it was when Captain Cook arrived. It's just a wonderful little window on what Australia was like in times past. To an Aboriginal person, they feel that the land owns them. These people believe that the land produced them, the land nurtured them, and therefore they had a responsibility in their lifetime to care for it. They feel they're part of it, it's part of them. The Aboriginal peoples understand the annual cycles of this harsh environment. Bushfires are a regular thing around here. For me, they're a thrilling and dynamic subject, especially at night. 
fire in this country is very important to the ecology, to the people who lived here. Traditionally, they used fire for keeping away mosquitoes, for being able to walk through the bush without seeing snakes. Their word for burning in this country is equivalent to cleansing. They see fire going through this country at low intensity like this as a cleansing process. It has the effect of renewing the landscape and of course that's very good for the wallabies and kangaroos and other herbivores. That lingering twilight blue set with the orange flame, it is really a great subject. It's a great uh, experience actually to be in a bushfire at night. The Kimberley hides countless cave paintings that are only known by Aboriginal people who call this place home, and a few tough Aussie blokes. Max Davison has rediscovered a few of these ancient rock canvases. Where the heck are you taking me? I think you just have to be patient, Art. We've uh, patient. got some really fantastic places to show you. Patience, not my forte. Well, this is the way I came in when I first found this site. And I'm only talking back 1988, not that long ago, Art. It was like finding El Dorado. Lord knows how many years I've been painting here for. It could be thousands and thousands of years. So we're looking at occupation at least going back 60,000 years. This is a fantastic gallery. It looks like there's a lot of layers. Well, there's probably thousands of layers there are. An elder told me that they can't repaint someone else's painting, but you put your painting over the top. So their story's there and your story's there. Without harming the other person's That's stories. right, it doesn't hurt the story at all. It doesn't matter how it's drawn, it's the story that they're relating that's the important part. So it's not done for art's sake. It's a historical yep. account. This is our book. There's such a strong sense of design in their depictions of animals. It's not realistic, it's stylized and rendered in a very simplistic way and yet so beautifully. One of the joys is just studying it and the more you look, the more you see. In this arid land, wetlands are especially precious. These are Ramsar wetlands. They're part of a big worldwide system they're trying to preserve. In Australian terms, this is as good as it gets. This is some of the best that we've got. We've got a challenge now to keep these places good. Lovely saltwater crocodile. Saltwater crocodiles like to thermoregulate. Body temperature is critical for them. The whole back of the animal is basically a big solar panel. They uh, store heat up to a certain level. When they sort of reach the optimum, sometimes they're too lazy to move, they only have to open their mouth. So that animal there with its mouth open is not being aggressive towards Art Wolf in any shape or form. It's just merely keeping its body temperature at an even level. I love these kind of shots where I'm abstracting nature, not just shooting portraits, but trying to create kind of a mystery around these great creatures and not telling the whole story in one photo. There's so much that's not known about these habitats. This particular habitat where you've got all these rich nutrients coming together in one place has attracted a lot of life. These little dragonflies are our common species here in the wetlands. Its proper name is the black-necked stork and they're found right up through Southeast Asia and into India. What we've got here is the Australian crane called a brolga. Beautiful. It 
We've got the potential for a really nice shot as we come up close to this pelican. He's moving, and if he takes off, I'm in a great position to get a good shot. He's thinking about it. He's walking back just so he has a little bit of a runway. He's repositioning, gauging the wind. One last instrument check. There he goes. Unfortunately, our human greed for fishing resources and everything else has depleted the resources here to the extent that these few places remaining like this are real gems. Just off the coast of the Northern Territories lies Elko Island, home to the largest Aboriginal community in Northeast Arnhem Land. Arnhem Land has been given a bit of elbow room. It's an Aboriginal reserve. People here have had a chance to look out at the rest of Australia and see what's happened to their people in other places where the Western society has just swamped them. Their culture is still here and alive and with them. So Art, I'll be uh, introducing you now to some of my aunties and nieces and these ladies are all relatives yeah, of mine. This is Art Muller. Yeah. Hello. Hello. How are you? Yeah. So you're making yeah. baskets. Yeah. I love baskets. I collect yeah. them from all over the world. Yeah. Can I take a picture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Will you do me a favor? And let me take one picture of the three of your heads as close as you can and show me. Yeah, yeah, just like this. Yeah, this is perfect. Okay, look at me and smile. Okay, so let's see what we got. Okay, will you take a picture of me? Come on, come here. Take a picture. Try, Hold try this. Take... Hold yeah. it. Okay, now you have to take a picture. You, you have to press, this one. press that and look through the viewfinder. Hold it up. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right. Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> The stringy bark is the most common eucalyptus tree in northern Australia. These trees, hollowed out by termites, are used to make the iconic Aboriginal instrument, the didgeridoo. Okay, Art, this is called gukku, bush honey or sugar bag, and it's a bush delicacy. Try it. Well, there's bees in there? Yeah, it's good for you. Protein. Um, I'll lick it. Good. Put it in your mouth and chomp it up. Mm. That's like molasses. It's very nice, very sweet, it's good for you. And when you finish eating the honey, you save the wax and that gets used to make the mouthpiece for the didgeridoo, the iraki. Oh, I see. Oh, you wasted this. a good bit of wax there. That's the first time in my life I've ever intentionally eaten an insect. And you enjoyed it, didn't you? I like the honey, I have to say. The bush here is full of resources, natural resources. To us, it looks pretty dry and boring, but if you're with Aboriginal people, like Jalu, never go hungry. What's happening here is that a group of people are preparing a bungal, which is the local word for a ceremony or a dance, and there's a lot of people gathering around because whenever people celebrate a story, it draws a crowd. It's another form of pantomime, I suppose, as far as the local people are concerned. It's entertainment, but it's also learning. They're passing on old, old, old stories to the younger ones. I've got this beautiful shot right now. These dancers, they're silhouetted against the late twilight. They're striking such beautiful poses right now. It's one of those really extraordinary moments. I feel that I'm photographing a timelessness, a, a tradition that is being passed from generation to generation in the form of the dance. And that's one of the missions I have, is to really record these cultures in all their glory.
that's nice. Look at that. Mm. What do you think, Peter? Am I a good photographer? Mingmuk. Mingmuk. That yeah. means the good. best photographer maybe yeah. on the planet. Mingmuk. <laughs> Mingmuk. Mm. That's the one. I did up, brother. I up, brother. Good day for flying, huh? It's a great day for flying. You ready to go? I'm ready to go. One of the things I really like to do is to move through the land, really record it from a ground perspective, but then when I get up in the air and I fly over it, it completely reveals itself on a different level. For me, it's fantastic. All the shapes, the textures, the colors, the lines, they all come out. And it is my favorite type of photography to do. We're in Western Australia now, in the Kimberley, a harsh paradise defined by rugged mountains and deep-cut gorges. In the far north of the Kimberley lies Mitchell Falls, a place of spiritual significance to the Aboriginal people. Joining me on the hike into the falls is my local guide, Brownie. Can you describe the Kimberley to me? The Kimberley is huge. It's isolated. It's the last frontier. But there's something about this country, and it's not just the country itself, it's the people, the Aboriginal people who not only belong in this country, are custodians for it, they belong to the country. The remarkable thing about Aboriginal culture is this whole universe of spiritual depth. So the Kimberley really has some major charms here, some Absolutely. magical places. Right, the sun's getting up. We've got a few k's walk uh, to get into Mitchell Falls. I never mind a few k's walk. All right, good. Well, we'd, uh, we might as well hit it, eh? Well, here we are, Mitchell Falls. It's known to the Wunumbal people as Punamiumpu. It's just one of the most incredible places in the world. This is where the main Wungur lives, the main creative serpent. In the creation time, when he created this, he rose up and invited all the other creative serpents from around the Kimberley to this one spot for a meeting to see and, and talk about creation, I suppose. And it's just a, a, a mega spot in the Kimberley. I'm shooting a very tight shot of the waterfall beyond me with a very long exposure. And with that long exposure, it literally renders the water into a very ribbony effect, very dreamy, very artistic. Canoeing into the gorges of the Kimberley is a great way to see the land. 
It's very linear. The lines are etched in this ancient stone. When I'm canoeing through it, every bend in a river reveals a new abstract. I'm not really trying to translate this land into depth or tell a story. I'm just trying to create a beautiful abstract pattern where it doesn't even look like traditional land photos. The other thing I'm trying to do is put the horizon right down the middle so the reflection and what is being reflected is equally important. As I walk up along this beautiful canyon, the light is changing, the foreground is changing, and I'm just looking intuitively to what works. This is among the oldest landscapes on Earth. The sense of ancient history really reverberates, whether it's the rock art we find on the walls or the way these beautiful rocky etched buttresses reach into the sky is a great landscape to photograph. I have found truly an abstract environment. And what it is is basically is perfect reflections or almost perfect reflections of rock and trees reflected into the very calm waters. For me, it's all about the detail. It's really where the brain works on a very intuitive, very artistic level. As the sun has dipped below the horizon on the subject I'm shooting, I've got light and dark and light and dark, and it's just a real beautiful and yet very, very transient time of day. As I shoot in this ancient canyon, I'm struck by the fact that my photography, like the Aboriginal people, is inseparable from the land. There's not too many gas stations around here. No, no, there's only two on the whole Gibb River Road. Wow. Mm. And you're lucky you pulled in here. We're the cheapest. This is an incredible area known as the Bungle Bungle. It's sandstone that's 360 million years old, and during the last 20 million years, it's been eroded into these beautiful beehive shapes. This labyrinth of rock has long been revered by aboriginals. It's astonishing to think that the Europeans never even discovered it until the early 1980s. As incredible as this place is from the ground, to really get a full appreciation for its extensive beauty, I really need to see it from the air. When you look at the Bungo Bungo, the first thing that comes to mind is it's extraordinarily designy. It's a graphic landscape.
Traveling in this remote corner of Australia has given me a strong sense of the power, the mystery, and the fragility of this ancient landscape and its Aboriginal culture. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge.